Well, welcome <laughs> to Family Bible Time. We're in Zephaniah chapter 2, we're in Luke 24. Exciting times. Let's pray and let's go. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us truth day by day. Please help us now as we study it. And pray that you'd be with us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Gather together, yes, gather, O oh, shameless nation, before the decree takes effect. We, um, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you burning anger of the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Because yesterday we were talking about global mm. judgment, future global judgment. The great day of the Lord is near, verse 14 in chapter 1. And verse 15, a day of wrath, a day of distress, a day of ruin, a day of darkness, a day of clouds, a day of trumpet blast, verse 16, and battle cry, and so on. So what's this talking about? I think it's rightly talking about the day of the Lord, looking into the future. But now he's saying to the people of Israel, um, seek the Lord, and perhaps you may be hidden. Now, if there was a near fulfillment of this, which I think there was, um, that would have been true. But I think it's also true for the far fulfillment that the ultimate day of the Lord, which um, is the final, you would say, full fulfillment of all of this prophecy, complete fulfillment of it all. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because you think, well, hang on a minute. If we understand the rest of the Bible's predictions about the, the future for Israel, there will be a time when they will call upon the name of the mm. Lord, when they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, finally. When they will turn to the Lord out of the midst of their distress, the day of Jacob's trouble, they're going to turn to the Lord, and the Lord will save them. The Lord will deliver them. Um, we know else from elsewhere that he's going to rescue them. He's going to take them away from the trouble to hide hide them um, in the wilderness. And, and so there are going to be people in Israel who will be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. So that's actually interesting, interesting prophecy right here in verse 3. Anyway, verse 4, for Gaza shall be deserted and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon and Ekron shall be uprooted Woe to you, inhabitants of the sea coast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O sea coast, shall be pastures, with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The sea coast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze, and in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will be mindful of them, and restore their fortunes. Mm. Uh, where have we read that before? Mm. Oh, just lots like of lots of times. <laughs> yes, this is interesting, isn't it? Because this is the theme, you remember, that Peter picks up in, in Acts chapter 3, when he talks about the time when God is going to restore the fortunes of the people of Israel. Mm. So this is what the prophets were predicting. This is what the people like Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and uh, all those, mm. Hannah and all those people were, were waiting for. 
when the, the Lord Jesus came. And they, they're just anticipating this time when the Lord is going to restore the fortunes of the people of Israel. Uh, so that's good to keep in mind. All right, verse 8. I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab, shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, the land possessed by nettles and salt pits, and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them, and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride, because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will become awesome, the Lord will be awesome against them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. And to him shall bow down each in its place all the lands of the nations. You also, O Cushites, shall be slain by, this, by my sword, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he, shall make, he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. Herds shall lie down in, the, in her midst of all kinds of beasts. Even the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals. What's that saying? That's saying that the capital, the, the capital cities are going to be a place where these kind of naturally timid animals mm. will feel perfectly safe. Owls and hedgehogs don't normally reside in towns and cities because it's too noisy and busy for them. They like mm. to be hidden away. Mm. Um, a voice shall hoot in the window. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so cool. I can't hoot. I can't hoot. <laughs> Devastation will be on the threshold. <laughs> Sorry, that was another Lord of the Rings <laughs> reference. Uh, for her cedar work will be laid bare. This is, a re this is the exultant city that lived securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. Let's talk about Nineveh. Wow. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. All right, that's going to be the result of the future judgment of Nineveh and Ammon and Moab and Cushites and all, all the surrounding nations are going to get it. Okay, verse 24, chapter 24 in Luke. This is a good chapter, yes. I love this chapter. It's a long one. Oh, it's partly why we're hurrying through chapter 2 now. We've got to 53 verses. And then it's good stuff, so let's get into it. But on the first day of the week, early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices, talking about the women, isn't it, who rested on the Sabbath the day before, taking spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And it wasn't because they'd washed it in daz or any other. It's not that funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other laundry detergent. Um, it's because they were angels. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground... The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? That has to be one of the greatest questions of all time, doesn't it? <laughs> Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was in, still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day, rise. Do you remember the fact that those things were hidden from them? Mm. They couldn't understand it. Anyway. And they remembered his words. Now, this is great because this is the moment when it's all starting to come together. And it's so good because it's starting to come together for these women who were there. Mm -hmm. And we should never despise. Some, some men take the take the doctrine of um, the headship of the husband and they take it too far and then they despise, inwardly, they despise women in general 
or they despise their wives. And we should never do that. God doesn't do that. Mm. The doctrine of headship is not a doctrine that allows men to despise women or to hate women um, or to think little of women. Here, I think, it is significant that God chooses women to be the first witnesses of the resurrection. And you're just about to see that sometimes, because of men's attitude towards the words of women, they don't always take them seriously. But that's that the men were wrong in this situation, and it's worth remembering that, and not carelessly and wrongly ignoring the testimony of a woman just because she's a woman. Anyway, verse 7, uh, verse 8, they remembered his words and returning from the womb, from the womb, returning from the tomb, <laughs> they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. So there's the apostles. And, you know, what are they thinking about at the moment? Well, we don't know exactly what they were thinking about, but they're obviously gathered together. We know that they were frightened. We know that they were obviously mourning over the death of Jesus and here's the women saying we went to the tomb and it was empty mm -hmm. and they're thinking it's just an idle tale what what are you talking about women mm -hmm. you know what what's hang on thankfully verse 12 Peter obviously took more notice than the others Pete but Peter rose John. we also know that John went with him and John was quicker mm -hmm. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marvelling at what had happened. Oh, that's really something, isn't it? Verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, if you're wondering how they were didn't recognize him, it's because their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Was that your question? <laughs> Go for it. Well, I didn't notice your finger, so tell me your question. I know you kept from her finger. My eyes <laughs> were, not, they were just down on the page. Go on. Do you think Luke was one of those two? No, I don't think it was Luke. Um, I don't think... One of them named Cleopas, we get the name for him in the verse 18... We don't know the name of the other. So I guess it could have been Luke, but I don't think so. Well, Luke always says we when he yes. pops up in Acts. That's a very he? good so point. He probably would have said we. Yes. yes. Yeah. It is the it is very good good observation though, because that's the kind of modesty particularly that John mm. uses to talk about himself. He doesn't kind of put his name in mm -hmm. there, but he talks about himself in this veiled way. Anyway, mm -hmm. and their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Verse 17, and he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the, the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, 
And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying they'd seen, they had even seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, isn't that interesting? What did Jesus do? Jesus gave them a Bible study. Mm -hmm. He walked them through one prophecy after another. Through now, it was an Old Testament Bible study mm -hmm. as well, beginning mm -hmm. with Moses, that would be the Pentateuch, and all the prophets, and in all the scriptures. He just, Jesus, obviously, just talking one scripture after another scripture after another scripture after another scripture and putting it all together for them. And sometimes it's really helpful to have someone who knows the Bible do that for you. But really, it's interesting. Mm. Verse 25, go back. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all, the, all that the prophets have spoken. Now, if it's not obvious, if it's not truly there in the Old mm. Testament, to, to the eye of a diligent and prayerful and careful student... Someone who's wise, who, who does what Solomon said and seeks wisdom like silver, searching for it like gold. Mm. Someone who prays like the psalmist, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your law. Who longs for the help of the Holy Spirit, doesn't just read carelessly, but who reads carefully and prayerfully. If it's not there, obviously, for those who read carefully and prayerfully, then couldn't have said foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's interesting, because that means that the, the teaching about Jesus is there mm -hmm. for those who read prayerfully and carefully and have the help of God, who are wise. Okay. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, which is kind of funny, isn't it? But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Now, some people have said, and I wonder about this, it could be true, that maybe when he took the bread and broke it, mm. what did they see? Nails. The nail prints in his hands, because later on, this very day, he's going to say to the disciples, see my hands and my side and my feet, and he's going to show them his hands and his feet. Anyway. Was it that? It doesn't say that. So we mustn't be dogmatic. Mm -hmm. It was when he took, maybe it was the way he, there was something about the way Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it that was just the way Jesus did it. Mm -hmm. You know that the way I pray at the meal table um, is just, you know, it's just that's my way of praying at the meal table. And if, if you were blinded and I then prayed that way at the meal table, you'd go, oh, it's dad praying, apart from recognizing my voice. But obviously something was also keeping them from recognizing his voice. By the way, if you think that's bizarre, remember that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. 
And remember that now their eyes were opened, verse 31, and they recognized him. So this is something divine going on here. There's also the reality that when you your expectations set what you can perceive and what you can't perceive. That's what magicians rely on, is the reality that in your mind, when you're expecting one thing, it's very difficult for you to see another. Yes, your question. You kind of wonder what they were seeing, like if it was, it looked like someone that they'd seen before on a journey that they went, or... Yeah, maybe he had a hood on. Uh, <laughs> maybe he had a robe, a hood, like a, a you know, a Jedi. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, I don't know. What did they wear? They wore robes, they wore cloaks, they had hoods, it might have been cold. Their faces were downcast, they were depressed, but, mm. but we know that their eyes were kept from mm. seeing him. So now their eyes are opened and they see him. From the moment they recognize him, verse 31, and they recognize him and he vanished from their sight. Which must have been really frustrating. <laughs> just the only thing is just like, gee, oh. he's gone. <laughs> okay. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road, when, while he opened to us the scriptures? They had burning hearts. Mm. That means they were just thrilled. They were just ecstatic to be in this Bible study. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, if you've never had that experience in a Bible study, you're missing out because mm -hmm. sometimes it's just like, oh, this is amazing. Okay, and if you're missing that, pray to God because you, you need to get into Bible study and when you see the truth about Jesus in the Bible, it is amazing. It thrills you. It, mm -hmm. Gives you holy heartburn, as it were. Not <laughs> literal heartburn. Anyway. Um, verse 33. And they rose at the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. They believed Simon. They didn't believe the women. Um, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now it's interesting, isn't it? Because the appearance to Simon, to Peter, isn't mentioned here. Mm. It is mentioned in the other Gospels. Mm -hmm. anyway, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. And we know El from elsewhere that the doors were locked. Mm -hmm. mm. So how did he get in? Mm. Ah, he's in a resurrection body. He can just come through the door. Just like he can go up and defy gravity <laughs> and just like he can appear on the road to Emmaus and then disappear in front of their eyes mm. that's interesting because we're going to have resurrection bodies according to 1 Corinthians 15 we're going to be have resurrection bodies which are like Jesus's resurrection body mm. which means that we're going to have what one Paul calls in 1 Corinthians 15 spiritual bodies a spiritual body what is that like? Well, the, the only thing, the only model we have for it is this. Mm -hmm. And that's exciting. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of being able to eat, but mm -hmm. not necessarily being limited to the physical, tangible realm, being able to go through locked doors and things like that. That's no. pretty cool. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'll be even, I'll be bugging you even more. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but then you'll be able to do it to me. So anyway, all right. So they rose, uh, got that, where are we? And Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And that helps you with your grammar, because it's mm -hmm. not it is me, it, mm -hmm. it is I. Mm -hmm. anyway. <laughs> Mom. Touch me and see. <laughs> me is the accusative. 
Um, touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and blood. Bone, bones. Bones. For a, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now this is interesting, isn't mm. it? Because I want to rescue poor old Doubting Thomas, as he's called. Mm. Poor Doubting Thomas. He's called Doubting Thomas because he said, I will not believe mm. unless I... T- put my hands in his mm. nail prints and in his side. And, and, and you say, okay, well, they, he wasn't there, mm. and they're, they're all shown his hands and mm. his feet. And they're all given the invitation here in verse 39, touch me and see. So they're allowed to actually touch him. Mm-hmm. You can gather, you can see them in your mind's eye gathering around him and touching him, and he's showing them his hands and his feet. Can you can you picture that? Mm. This is this is me. It's it is really me, says Jesus. In verse forty one, and while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, in other words, they're sitting there going, "I can't believe it! I can't believe it! I can't believe it!" <laughs> but they're actually. <laughs> they're actually believing it, but they're mm. disbelieving for joy, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Mm-hmm. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? Because they're still kind of thinking, are we having a vision? Is this mm. real? Like, this is just... That... Now, by the way, if you ever wanted proof that the disciples knew that Jesus actually died, this is it. They're just... Mm. They're, they're, they can't believe he's alive. Mm-hmm. Because they knew, they saw him crucified, they saw him die, mm-hmm. they saw him buried. Mm-hmm. He was really dead, but now he's really alive. <laughs> and so he says, give me something to eat. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a ghost. The, the fish didn't go into his mouth and then just drop straight to the floor. Mm-hmm. It went into his stomach. And you say, what happened to it in his stomach? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> does, it, does it just... Did the fish just get digested like normal? There are all sorts of bizarre questions you can ask at that point. Mm. But we don't have the answers to them. And he just then off he goes back into the spiritual world. Um, in a minute. Anyway, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. And everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Mm. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. By the way, there's no single scripture that just Mm. says that. But when he says, thus it is written... He's referring to the fact that in, you know, if you were to summarize mm. the prophecies in the Old Testament, about Isaiah and, uh, and so on, you would get this message. Mm. And verse 47, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. By the way, mm. that's our message. Our message is we preach... We proclaim, in Jesus' name, Mm. repentance and forgiveness of sins. Yes, you can borrow my ink pen, but you can't borrow my red pen because it ain't here, it's upstairs. Um, That's really significant. Look, if your message doesn't represent Mm. this, it's lacking. If your church doesn't preach repentance, it's not preaching the message. It's all very well to to preach the good news. Yeah, that's true. That's the good news is forgiveness of sins, right? But the good news comes with a command to repent and be baptized. Actually, if your church doesn't preach, if your preacher doesn't preach repentance, if your preacher doesn't call people to repent, mm-hmm. your pastor, your preacher is not preaching this message. You could point this out to him and say. Um, Pastor, I'm a little concerned because your messages are nice and your messages, you talk about the good news 
but I don't hear you preach repentance. But in Luke 24, 47, it says that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. So when are you going to preach a message about repentance? That would be a good question to ask. And it would be very interesting to hear the answer from a lot of churches in this country um, who fail to do that. You cannot afford to think that you can do better than do what Jesus said. Mm. All right. Beginning from Jerusalem. Verse 48. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. What's that? That's the Holy Spirit that's going to come in Acts chapter 2. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany. And that's a good example. Stay in the city, and then he led them out. Well, obviously... Stay in the city didn't mean you're not allowed to see, leave the city at all, ever. But stay put yes, here until you're clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. Mm. And that's interesting, the fact that they were in the temple doing it. Because, well, as you'll see in the book of Acts, when we next get there. Oh, hang on a minute, we've been there. Um, well, you've been there in the book of Acts. And you know that actually Paul went into the temple the, in Acts chapter 15. They, um, uh, in Acts chapter 21, they had disciples who were under a vow and they presented sacrifices in the temple. Mm -hmm. At this point, although Christianity has begun, there's nothing wrong inherently with the temple and, and the sacrifices in the temple. <laughs> to be going into the temple, you had to be ceremonially clean. And the sacrifices that you presented in the temple, yes, Jesus' sacrifice, as we learn from Hebrews, was the once-for-all sacrifice. And those sacrifices in the temple could never take away sins. They couldn't do that. But they did cleanse people ceremonially to allow them to go into the temple, didn't they? That was the way God set it up. And so I don't have a problem with after Jesus, and even after Jesus' resurrection, even after Jesus has explained to them in, in verse 45, open their minds to understand the scriptures, and he's, um, he's explained to them the things in the law and the prophets and the Psalms that have to be fulfilled and so on, and he's opened their minds, so he's taught them. He's taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of God, and they're still okay with going into the temple and presenting a sacrifice. So I don't have a problem. Sorry, I need to go. You need to go. I don't have a problem with, with the idea that in the future, in the millennium, there's going to be a temple and there's going to be sacrifices because Jesus didn't seem to have a problem with it here, neither did the apostles in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay? Father in heaven, we pray that Lord, you would open our minds to understand the scriptures more and more. And we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you've got a rush. I've got a sermon to prepare. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.